Well, the Texas Rangers are actually the old Washington Senators, so I was rooting for I was rooting for Texas, and it came back to pitching. Um, I don't have anything in my pocket, but I do have a poem that I think you can relate to. In the days before cell phones, we spent our time looking for loose change. We ran to the phone, we tripped over phone cords, or stood on lines waiting to use a phone. We forgot phone numbers. We were listed in phone books. There was no text messaging. In the days before cell phones, there was phone sex, and people slept with their phones. Phones were big and hung on walls. You could cradle a phone and wait for a sweet dial tone. If you were lonely, you could call the operator. There was always someone to assist you. Today, everyone has a cell phone. They spend days and nights talking in strange places. You could be in the middle of reading a poem, and someone's <laughs> cell phone will ring. In the days before cell phones, you searched frantically in your bag, trying to find something to write with. You wanted to find a pen, not a phone, before the ringing in your head stopped. And that's cell phone. I'm very happy to, to be here, and um, two weeks ago, uh, I met a, a, a writer that I, I had never met, um, and that's uh, Maxine Hung Kingston, uh, and just a very beautiful person, and she's like about 70 now, so she's writing about being an elder, saying, I'm just 61, I'm trying, trying to become an elder, and, and this is, I like to read other people's work, this is from Maxine Hung Kingston, to be the poet, because what she's doing now and she's reaches 70, she's moving away from the long book. And she's writing poems and she's writing more diary entries. And this is from her book, you know, To Be a Poet. Diary entry, March 26, The Poet's Day. Wander through the day. Choose among treasured things and wrap the gift and give it away. <coughs> Sit and jot. Wash the dishes after every meal and snack. Run errands and know you are running errands. Buy cheap, beautiful notebooks. Sit and jot some more. Use each fountain pen. Do not be so afraid. Now what is she telling us? She's telling us to, to sort of live in the moment. You know, be mindful of what you do. Okay, and, and, and I like to connect, you know, people's poems to my own. And here's one of my own poems. Fix something that is broken. When you rise, fix something that is broken. It will make a difference between yesterday and today. Repair your heart before you love. Touch another person with hands that whisper or kiss. Now, how many of you got up this morning and you knew there was something that you needed to repair? Right? <laughs> You're right. You know, the car didn't work. You know, so, you know so, there's all, when you look at it, there's always something that needs, that needs repair. And many times what happens, we overlook it. We hope somebody else will do it. Okay? Um, but what does the poem also say? The poem also says before you do these things, you have to repair sometime your heart. Okay? So there's other things that you have control over. And, and, and so the, the poem sort of functions that way. Being aware of who you are now in this time, this sort of mindfulness. And then what your responsibility is. Because when you look around the world, I think what you'll find is that there are many countries that today are broken, okay? If, if we were to take a field trip right now and return with me to Washington, D.C., we can stand on 14th and U Street in Washington, D.C., and we are still recovering from the riots of 1968. I don't know what's gonna happen to Mogadishu, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I know that D.C. has taken a number of years to, to, for us to have a Starbucks. Um, so <laughs> for those of you who are math majors, you can do the math. <laughs> you know, no Starbucks coming today. Uh, let me read you um, the title poem of this collection. The air is an organ made for love. Um, what I did, <laughs> I'll mention names. Is this being recorded? Yeah, I mean, thank, I'll mention names. I took my, um, I was nice for, for, for a long time. 
uh, I took my book back from um, Northwestern University Press um, because I was not up for tenure, so I'd need a university press to publish my next book. And I knew that I was not going to make any money off my next book, uh, nor did um, I you know, get into the poetry business to write to making money. And so my next book, you know, like some of these poems that I'm reading right now, you can go online to my website, you know, and, and get the, you know, download it and get the poems for free, okay? <laughs> now you won't get me to sign them, so, but you know, um, you will have them. This is the title poem, The Air is an Organ Made for Love. It was the language that left us first. The great migration of words. When people spoke, they punched each other in the mouth. There was no vocabulary for love. Women became masculine and could no longer give birth to warmth or a simple caress with their lips. Tongues were overweight from profanity and the taste of nastiness. It settled over cities like fog, smothering everything in sight. My ears begged for camouflage and a chance to go to war. Everywhere was the decay of how we sound. Someone said it reminded them of the time Sonny Rollins disappeared. People spread stories of how the air would never be the same or forgive. It was the end of civilization and nowhere could one hear the first notes of a love supreme. It was as if John Coltrane had never been born. Now, where does this poem come from? I don't know how to drive. They say, if you don't know how to drive, and you're 35 years old, and you find yourself on a public bus, it means your life is a failure. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> but I say, I don't know how to drive, but I've been driven. But what happened is, 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 is I'm forced to use public transportation in DC. And there's one line called the 70 bus, which is one of the longest routes in, in, in Washington. It goes from like one neighborhood to the next. There is so much drama on the 70s bus that, y you know, you don't need to be an artist, you know. And, and, and what I started listening to was just how people were talking. And, and, and I was hearing so much stuff that when I got off the bus, I said, I've got to clean my ears. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you have had your ears professionally cleaned? Oh, see? Now, you go, let me see those hands again. Now, you remember when you got those ears cleaned, you could hear the people in the next room? I mean, oh man, like, whoa, man, that brother got some nice poetry. <laughs> you can hear, you know what I'm saying, when you clean your ears out, and most of us have what? So you know it's only a few hands went out, okay? Then maybe you had an ear infection, you went, but you know what I'm sounding, you know, you get your ears clean out. So here I am, because I'm riding the bus every day, my ears are getting filled with all this profanity and stuff, and I go home, and I have to clean my ears out, and I say, how can I do it? And I said, let me get some jazz up in there. I can't deal with Beyonce. She's not going to do it. Lady Gaga is not going to make it. I got to go some deep. The wax is deep. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The wax is deep. So what happened? I got to play some John Coltrane, some Cecil Taylor, some Sunra to get that out. Anyway, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Right, space is the place. This is the next poem. So this is what the living do. When did we begin to wear sneakers to funerals, or sports jerseys and caps. When did things begin to die? I pass a church four blocks from the Safeway. I see the last generation of old black men in suits. These men are professionals. They touch death every day. They carry the coffin and drive the hearse. They arrange the flowers and offer comfort. They escort you into limos and tell you where to sit. They know the directions to the cemetery. What do you know? I know that I am dying. Dreams first of what you might call the lint of disappointment. It's always been this way, this knowing, the realization that I will do this alone. I once believed in love the way I believed in beauty, the living with dignity, style, and grace. I thought my shoes always needed to be polished whenever I left the house. There's a way the city ends after you pass a funeral. How you walk down the street, afraid to look over your shoulder. They say, this is what the living do. Now, um, one of the things that you can do if, if you write poetry, you can just create people. See, I created these guys. <laughs> <laughs> just joking. They're in the next book. <laughs> anyway. Um, I created this, this um, because of changing demographics, I, I, I created a little character by the name of, of um, Omar. 
and he's a uh, yeah, oh, no more. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so I I created. <laughs> so I created I created Omar oh, Omar, and um, this is a, a Omar poem. Sister Sheba Omar and me. Sister Sheba, she's my cousin. She lives across town where my mama tells me not to go, not unless it's daytime and the sun is out bright. Don't you go over there without asking, my mama say. And when I ask her, she tells me no. So I don't ask no more. You know what I mean. <laughs> and so I have to wait for Sister Sheba to come and see me and tell me everything my mama don't want me to know. So why you have a Muslim for a friend, she asked me. The next weekend my aunt visits, my mama, and Sister Sheba visits me. Sister Sheba, she's always trying to get into your business, which is why she don't have no time for herself. Her hair be fine all directions, and my, my mama don't even want to let her in the house. And if she sees her outside, she don't say she's family, because why embarrass yourself in public? If you don't have to, that's what my mama say, and that's why, but that's what Anna Banana says too. Anna Banana is my guidance counselor. Her real name is Mrs. Bernstein, but everyone calls her Anna Banana, because she's always telling kids that if they would give up junk food and just eat fruits and vegetables, everything would be okay in school. <laughs> Our grades would improve, and we would have what she calls self-esteem and be like white kids, which is crazy to me, since we're all black. <laughs> and that's why we call Mrs. Bernstein Anna Banana. And my mama calls her a real fruitcake. <laughs> and says that woman shouldn't even be around kids, let alone trying to guide them somewhere. And today, Sister Sheba sounds just like Anna Banana, asking why I have a Muslim for a friend. She saw Omar in my house last month and asked me where his shoes were. I said, they're by the front door. Did you see them when you come in? <laughs> Omar takes off his shoes wherever he comes to see me, just like in the mosque he's always talking about. And I ain't seen because my mama said, boy, you was a problem in my womb. And so I don't need no, you know, no strange influences. So I don't get to go to the mosque with Omar, but he gets to play with me because my mama said, that boy should have some fun. Most Muslims I see don't even smile, she tells me. What the Lord gives you some teeth for if you can't smile. So I tell Sister Sheba to get her face out of mine and leave Omar alone. And why she can't mind her own business when she visits is beyond me. Omar says I should pray or do salat, something like that, because Sister Sheba lives where the bad boys are. Omar says she's going to have a baby and maybe never finish school. I tell Omar to shh and hush his face. Sometime Omar can be a real Anna Banana, but he's still my best friend. My best friend ever, what my mama calls an apple in the hands of Eve. Hmm, I wonder what my mama means by that. You think Mrs. Bernstein knows? <laughs> <laughs> Let me fast forward. <laughs> Let me fast. Let me see if I can. Uh, I'll get back to that. I'll, I'll read you one more. One more bone. This is, uh, I can show you. This is, this is how the, this is two. I'll read, I'll read you two more. This is called the equator. So what's that line around your nose? Your, the equator or something? I'm in the playground sitting next to Omar and in between him and Natalie. She's a new girl with the old clothes who moved into the corner house one month ago. What you talking about? She squeaks. Her voice has that little girl sound like she could sing high notes and maybe call herself Mariah. But she's just Natalie from down the street. Why are you staring at my nose? You just a silly looking boy with one of them Muslim hats on your head. You shouldn't even be looking at me. Why you look at me? Why you look at me? Why? You tell me why. <laughs> I'm between Omar and Natalie and this is what my mama means when she says if you make your bed you gotta lie in it. Or maybe this is a hard place and the rock is here too. I don't know. It was me who decided not to do my homework, so here I am listening to Omar trying to talk all smart and talk about geography, like he knows where he is. Omar don't know nothing about no equator. You can't see the equator fool, I tell him. You just want to mess with Natalie's nose. <laughs> In between my words, her tears gather like clouds coming from behind the big buildings and telling us it's time to go. But it's Natalie's crying which makes me shiver. She, she stutters and tries to find her own reign of words. My, my daddy broke my nose when I was small because I didn't stop crying. He broke my nose, and it left a mark. Natalie's words catch Omar and me like we was running, and now we both out of breath. Omar's pushing me out the way and puts his arm around Natalie's shoulder like he's the equator. I guess this was the right thing to do if we added our ages together. Sometimes Omar does things I wish I could do. Sometimes he just sees things I'm too young to see. And then um, I wrote this poem about Omar after 9-11. And in fact, I wrote this poem October 12, 2001 in Nashville, Tennessee. Looking for Omar. I'm in the school bathroom washing my hands without soap, but I'm still washing my hands. I turn the water off and look for paper towel, but paper towels have been gone since the first day of school and it's June now. I start to leave the bathroom with my wet hands, but then the big boys come in talking loud and cussing like they rap stars that have new sneakers. I hear the one named Pinto talking about how someone should get Omar after school since he's the only Muslim they know. Pinto talks with an accent like he's new in the neighborhood too. I don't have to ask him what he's talking about since everybody's talking about the towers and how they ain't there no more. My mama said it was like a woman losing both breasts to cancer. And my daddy was talking at the dinner table about how senseless violence is. And Mrs. Gardner next door lost two tall boys to drive-bys, bullets flying into both boys' heads, making them crumble too. 
Everybody around here is filled with fear and craziness, and now Pinto and the big boy are thinking about doing something bad. I stare at my wet hands dripping water on my shoes and wonder if I should run and tell Omar or just run. I feel like I'm trapped in the middle of one of those Bible stories, but it ain't Sunday. I hear my mom's voice saying, boy, always remember to wash your hands, but always remember you can't wash your hands from everything. Uh, let, me, let me read you an excerpt from Fathering Words um, and tell you how I became a writer. I went off to Howard University to find a wife. <laughs> Everybody tells me that. <laughs> Why did you go off to Howard? <laughs> Higher education, that's what I called it. <laughs> you know? uh, but I did, and, and, you know, and let me tell you this. You know, I went to a historically black school, and if you go back to like the 1950s, if you were like an African-American woman uh, and you went off to college, uh, and then you like dropped out after like that first semester, but you met somebody who was like a, a future doctor, a lawyer, or a dentist, then you did good. You had graduated <laughs> for the entire family. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and so everybody says, well, you know, I, I figured out that, you know, anybody think about this. Think about it. How many, how many, if you're not married, let's look at this. You know, we can go to the videotapes on this one. How are you going to meet your partner? Let's figure this out, right? Bump into somebody like maybe in school, right? Cafeteria you know, party, bar, online, <laughs> or just look, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, but there's not too many, you know, it's, 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 like, it's, like, it's like, like winning the lottery. So you're out here looking for somebody, you know, looking at books and stuff and horoscopes, and it's difficult. But I figured the best opportunity I had to find one of my Nubian princes, you know, was at Howard University. So I set off. And anyway, <laughs> this is how I became a writer. Langston Hughes did not live in Cook Hall. I was the only poet in a dorm filled with future doctors, lawyers, preachers, teachers, government workers, musicians, dentists, soldiers, lovers, drug addicts, crazy Negroes, Muslims, Republicans, gays, and guys who would see you every day and not speak. It was not the best place to become a writer. <laughs> I should have left Howard like Langston left Columbia. Would I have thrown my books into the ocean? 1968, and the nation is bleeding from too many wounds. I am in a classroom trying to take notes and pay attention. Margaret, a small girl from Newport News, kisses me and turns my mouth to paper. I am filled with words. Is this poetry? At night, small fragments begin to breathe. I like the feel of creating something. My father taught me how to sketch, to make shapes, to turn circles into faces, add a nose, two eyes and ears. Poetry is like drawing. I find a line I like and turn it over and over in my head. I stretch the words, bend them, place them on the page, change them again. I enjoy this more than going to class. I begin to think about blackness, not the color of my skin, but the color of ideas. Fanon, Nkrumah, Du Bois are new names for me. I'm learning how to swim in a big sea. This is how I go off to college in 68. And let me take you back. My mother, I'm like the first in my family to go off to family. You know, and what does my mother tell me? She gives me that little bit of advice. She tells me, she says, don't let anyone tell you it's yours. Now, you ever see this old movie, Do the Right Thing, Spike Lee did? Right. You know, there's that scene with him and Ozzy Davis playing the, you know, and he said, Mookie, always do the right thing. And Mookie said, okay, that's it. I got it. I'm out of here. But my mother says to me in the South Bronx, don't let anyone tell you it's yours. I've never had sex. I don't know what my mother's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it's yours? What are you talking about? <laughs> I did not know. But my mother, bless her little heart, she felt her son, her baby. I mean, how many of you baby the family? You see, babies. I thought for many years that my name was Shh. Could they see you? Shh. You know? <laughs> Shh. <laughs> the baby. <laughs> shh. You, see, I, that's why I got into memoir writing, to figure out how can I explain shh. You know, then that's how you write the memoir, you know what I'm saying? But what happened, I didn't know these things. And so what my mother had did, and this is, you know, this like modernism stuff, my mother had reduced my sex education to some sort of like little zen cone. You know, like, you know what I'm saying? And, and a little bit of wisdom that I would eventually grow into. But what did she, what was she afraid of? She was afraid. See, and this is weird. She didn't even understand that much African American history. She was afraid that some little woman like Margaret Chambers from Newport News, one of the little southern towns, sleepy southern town, would snatch up a young boy and sell him down to Mississippi or something, and I would be writing poems from New Orleans or Baton Rouge. You know, what happened? That was her fear. Anyway, that's just a story. <laughs>
Is, let me um, read you an excerpt from um, the fifth inning. And what happens to your work, depending on, on, on where you read something, um, it takes on a completely different meaning. I was in Boston, and I read from this, and I'm in Boston. And I said, all of a sudden, this makes more sense. And I'll read this to you. This is in the fifth inning. I'm reading this in Boston like a week ago. On August 18th, 1967, in Fenway Park, Jack Hamilton threw a ball that hit Tony Colindiano. The young Boston Red Sox star suffered a broken cheekbone and damage to his left retina. A door began to close on a promising career. I was never a Red Sox fan. Growing up as a child in the South Bronx, I quickly became a Mantle and Maris boy. Me, a Yogi Berra, Elston Howard, Johnny Blanchett, Hector Lopez, Bobby Richardson type of guy. I loved the Yankees and wanted to inherit Cleet Boy's position at third base. I wanted to dive into the dirt and backhand hard-hit grounders near the bag. I wanted to throw runners out from my knees. Baseball was my religion. I didn't grow up hating the Boston Red Sox. Looking back on my childhood, maybe it was this team that introduced me to poetry. I just loved saying the names of the guys who played for them. Names like Carl Yastrzemski, Bill Mambouquet, Tony Caligliano, and of course, Pumpsy Green. Pumpsy, Pumpsy, is that Pumpsy? Yes, he was one of the first black players on the Red Sox. I had his baseball card, Pumpsy, a name as different as some folks find Ethelbert today. <laughs> and Pumpsy Green. <laughs> you know, I was supposed to be here, like, I guess like in the Matrix, I was supposed to be here like about a year ago and, and my mother died and, and so, um, I, I couldn't make the trip, and, and I want to read these poems because several years ago, um, my sister called me. I was up at Bennington teaching, and my sister called me from New York, and she said, you better come down here because I don't think Mom's going to last that long. And um, I rushed down to New York, and I get to the hospital, you know, I dash into the room, and there's my mother looking good. <laughs> and, and in five minutes, you know, we were in an argument, and I had a poem. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what the doctor had found, but I found a poem. <laughs> and this is called Boxing With Your Mom. It has an epigraph by Yusuf Komanyaka. Whoever said men hit harder when women are around is right. You push the door open, not knowing what to expect. She sits in a chair next to a hospital bed, just sitting. How long? Before you can even enter the room, a big smile of recognition kisses her lips before she kisses you. Her seamstress eyes survey your clothes, you're a rhinestone of a sun slipping between her shaking hands. As the sparkle leaves her eyes, she withdraws under her hospital robe. So small she looks, so small she is. You want to leave, but you just came. It's just you and her, you're overmatched. Her moods change so quickly you can't avoid her jabs. There's bitterness in each blow. She has you against the wall. You're fighting with her again. This is sick, you tell yourself. You want to leave but the bell never rings. You're trying to love her too much. You're losing another round. And um, this is uh, my mother. This is when you sometimes you see your mother in a public place and, and you know your mother is, 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 is becoming older. And this is called Departures and Arrivals. My mother and I are at a train station. She's returning to New York. We are early, so I leave her sitting on a bench alone. I walk over to where the telephones are and strike the pose of a movie star waiting to kiss a lover goodbye. I don't smoke, so I have no cigarette to dangle from my hands or lips. I stare at my mother sitting on the bench. She's talking to herself. I think how crazy she looks. She clutches her pocketbook fearful full of strangers. She looks at me with eyes that forget I am her son. It's always been this way one of us going somewhere without the other. Now, look at how times change the poem, you see? Just look at this, okay? I walk over to where the telephones are and strike a pose. Like, to me, you know, you, you know, like being cool. See, now I'm in Texas, I can tell this joke. I can tell my Texas joke, okay? Tell my Texas joke. 
I, I, was, I did a lot of work for um, Laura Bush when she was um, first lady organizing the book fair. And I always felt during the time when things were going bad for, for, the, for, for President Bush that I could help him out by the simple thing of what? Putting a cigarette in his hand during press conferences. <laughs> Small things like a cigarette changes your standard. So what can happen? This is how we could do it. You add a cigarette to his hand, and he can just take in the Rose Garden, and you say, um, the war is not going well. <laughs> I think, you see what I'm saying? The small gesture. You see, if you go back to the 1950s, and you see some of the talk shows, I mean, a perfect example is Jimmy Baldwin. You look at old footage of Jimmy Baldwin smoking, and, and, and guys in the 50s had an art where they could smoke, and there was never any dropping of ashes. You know, like on those old William Buckley shows. There was never any ashes <laughs> dropping. You know, if you're, if, you're, if you're a public intellectual, your ashes don't drop in public. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> your research and your, your footnotes may drop, but not your ashes, you know? But anyway, I just, as I was reading that, I, I, this whole thing that I could see how, how language had changed and we had moved away. Now, let me read this poem about the women. And, and one of the things I've been looking at has been, and you've probably been looking at it too, I've been looking at a lot of the demonstrations around the world. And, and one of the things I always look at is, is the composition. Uh, and, and when I just see, for example, just men protest, I, I, I worry about that because it reminds me of like a scene out of either Clockwork Orange or, or um, Clockwork Orange, what's the other one? Um, I'll remember it in a second. No, not 1984. Lord of the Flies, you want one, one of the two, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Lord of the Flies or Clockwork, you got me. But I remember in Iran um, when the people were protesting, there were a lot of women, okay. And then I told somebody, I said, you will, you could monitor when our, the government of Iran begins to crack down when you see the composition of the protests change. And you saw, for example, like the women began to disappear. And so I wrote a poem about the women in Iran. This is what will happen to the women. This is what will happen to mothers daughters, sisters, aunts, and grandmothers. This is what is probably happening now. Some of the women will be arrested. Some of the women will return home and be worn. Some of the women will remain in prison. Some of the women will be in prison for hours. Some of the women will be in prison for days. Some of the women will be in prison for months. Many women will forget they are in prison. Some of the women will be blindfolded. Some of the women will be tortured. Some of the women will be raped. Some will confess to truth. Some will confess to lies. Some will simply confess. Other women will cover their faces. Other women will cover their hair. Other women will cover their lives. This is what happens to mothers. This is what will happen to our sisters. This is what happens to aunts. This is what will happen to our daughters. There are many grandmothers who are silent. There are many grandmothers praying in the back of mosques. There are too many women swaying in sorrow. This is what happens to mothers, daughters, sisters, aunts, and grandmothers. This is what many men in the world witness. This is what many men give birth to. And uh, I'll read um, um, I'll read a poem. Now, let me show you about language. Now, not to offend anybody, but this poem, you have, you, have to, you have to have the language in here, or else the poem won't work. Okay, the poem won't work. So this is me saying, okay, close your ears. If you're born again, you'll have to hear the poem again. Um, <laughs> I'm not just messing with you guys. <laughs> what happened is, uh, but this, is, this just shows you a perfect example that you can't, the poem doesn't work without the language, okay? Now, I do a lot of fundraising. <laughs> you have to do, you guys got to do that too, right? So I go to a lot of meetings, and, 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 and what happens if people are talking about money, right? That's what people do. So when I, you can, this is participation. When I say money, I point to you guys say money. And say, yeah, okay, got it. Meetings for Holly. I'm sitting in another meeting where people are talking about money. money. They call this fundraising. We spend the time talking about people who have money. money. We mention names of people we don't know. This is what you do when you don't have money. money. You talk about people who do. <laughs> Before the meeting ends, there's agreement among everyone to contact three people who have money. I leave the meeting knowing I won't make any calls. <laughs> I walk down the street talking to myself. At the bus stop, I search my pockets for money. This too is fundraising. <laughs> when the bus arrives, all the poor people board. 
I'm on my way to another meeting. The poor people are going to work. A guy sitting in front of me is yelling on his cell phone. He's talking about money. He says, I don't give a fuck. I want my fucking money. This, too, is fundraising. <laughs> <laughs> How are we doing on time? If I may, okay. Let me, let me just read, uh, I'll read, I'll read one poem um, to close and then we can have questions. Um, what happens is that you, you stumble upon um, poems uh, and some poems are created because of um, the technology. You know how you have your signature in your email? Okay. So what I used to do, uh, I used to change it, but then for a number of years I, I had a signature that says, uh, I would have loved you like Ellington loved jazz and Beard and Love Scissors. That's referring to Romare Beard you know, in his collages. And so what happened, that was always on my uh, email. And then I started exchanging a lot of email with my buddy, Elizabeth Alexander. You're probably familiar with her. She read the poem during Obama's inauguration. Uh, so Elizabeth would write back, back and forth, like, I love you more than so-and-so loves such and such. So it was like this back and forth, you know. And so what I did, I took all the, the lines that I was writing and I weaved them together um, for a poem that I read at my friend's wedding, Alex Pate, who's a writer. Uh, in Minnesota, and one of the lines I had in the poem that I dedicated at his wedding was, I, I would love you more than the Minnesota love the twins, you know, because I was, you know, I took that out. But this is, my this is my closing poem. It's called Divine Love. I wish I had loved you many years ago. I would have loved you like Ellington loved jazz and Beard and loved scissors. I would have loved you like Langston loved Harlem and the blues loved muddy waters. I would have loved you like Douglas loved to read and Garvey loved parades. I would have loved you like Zora loved stories and Du Bois loved suits. I would have loved you like Lewis loved boxing and Mahalia loved to sing. I would have loved you like Carver loved peanuts and Wheatley loved poems. I would have loved you like Jimmy loved Lorraine and Ozzy loved Ruby. I would have loved you like Martin loved Jesus and Malcolm loved Allah. And that's usually my last poem. Um, so I want to thank you uh, in terms of um, being my audience, and, and now we can have some questions. Um. Uh, mm -hmm. like Any students need to go to class, now would be the appropriate time to... I, I have a class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> so. yeah I, I just with a time in my hand. Yeah, we, we, we all develop our huh. little patterns and finding those holes in yeah. the schedule is... But, but it was good, but I, you know, I was raising myself, I said, it must be a time for the thing to yeah. yeah. work out, as opposed to, like, you say, people like to get up. Yeah, well, we just kind of started to see this with the influx of the freshmen the first few years of the series. We didn't right. have it, because oh, we didn't really right, have right. Day, enough right. day classes. I see. It was almost the evening classes? Most evening? evening? Late evening, after, after work. Yeah, after work oh, kind of stuff. Wow. And then with the freshmen, so yeah. at least they go to class. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they go to class. I'll get some my water. <laughs> is it, no, I don't think this. Is this my water? Or? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that must be my water. Yeah. Yeah, that's my water. Okay. Okay. So any any questions you have? You have a nice smile. Is that okay? All right. Hi. How you doing? Condoleezza Rice is making her book mm -hmm. now. Right. Have you ever had any interface with her when you mentioned the butchers? Um, I've only I've only saw Condoleezza Rice once. Um, it was at uh, the National Book Fair. Um, we had a, a, a big reception at the Library of Congress. That's the only time I, I've met her. I met one of her um, cousins who does a lot of work in the Bay Area. No, L.A. or with gangs and stuff. Um, I think that Condoleezza Rice comes from a very, you know, um, uh, high-powered family. You know, uh, I think that she's um, pretty much a person who, when she was at, oh no, I know what I met her when she was at Stanford. I remember she was at Stanford because what happened? She spoke and, and she came into my office. This is this is many years ago because she was provost. She said she's at Stanford. That's when I first met her. Yeah, without just recalling that. Yeah, but I, I, you know, what happens is that I look at how, um, you know, people uh, make a contribution to, to their times. Uh, I look at people in terms of before public service and after. And so I'm, I'm really looking at what people like Condoleezza Rice and others will do now that they're out of office. The same way I think Jimmy Carter sets an example 
Okay. Or even with Obama. Keep in mind, Obama's very young. I mean, you know, his, his major contribution may be after he's president of the United States. You know, this is just how, like, many of us, for example, those of you who are in college right now, you're not going to have one career. You're not going to work in the auto industry in the post office and then retire with a good pension. <laughs> you know? so, so basically what happens, you, you, you may have three or four careers. I mean, so it's very interesting to see you know, someone like Condoleezza Rice, you know, I think might be working on a children's book. You never know where that might take off. And, and, and all of a sudden, you know, she, she reinvents herself after you know, the various positions that she's had. She has a Texas connection now, a huge oil tanker. Just been named after. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I, don't, I can't see her running for public office. I think, for example, the demands of public office right now are, are, is one uh, where you really have to love it. You know, you wind up giving up a life you know, in terms of your family, things of that sort. You know, and um, that only comes around once. You know, and, and these are very demanding times. You know, I mean, if you're like National Security Advisor, Secretary of State, bless you. These, these are demanding, demanding times. You know, and, and so I think we've seen a number of people who have made a contribution to, to, their, to our community. Um, we probably will not know the full contribution they've made because of the times. Uh, I tell people to go back and look at the first press conferences and interviews, which, the first interviews with, with Cheney, okay, after 9-11. Completely changed, you see? And what happens, uh, we're not privileged to some of the information you know, that the President of the United States received. We don't know the full threats of the country. And so when we say, okay, we may disagree with some of these policies, but we're not being brief. You know, same way, for example, in the last campaign, I think Hillary Clinton said it best. You campaign in poetry, but you govern in prose. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Mm -hmm. um, after, we're, we're, uh, I'm in a 1302 English class, and right now we're working on a research paper, but when we're done, we're gonna do, uh, work on the piano lesson. Mm -hmm. Do some writings about it, and I understand that you do August. Oh yeah, yeah. So I'd like to get some of your insight about that, the, about his writing and uh, the piano lessons specifically. Well, you know what I, I, I deal with. <laughs> we had the piano lesson to last night. You know what happens now, um, and I, I look, I look at it personally. Okay, what happened? My 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 mother died. Okay, and what happens is that you know my family is very small. So now in the in, in, in the issue was what to do with the piano. So, you know, I grew up with a piano, you know, that there was in the house, and all of a sudden now, my sister is a, has a, I have the house. So of course, we don't want to give the piano away because piano is like, an, it's your inheritance. It, it, well, it's your inheritance, okay? So I had to deal with, with that issue, I, and I think all of us, probably, if you see this play or, or, or read this play, it has a lot to do with your family. You know, and, and, and what's being passed down from one generation to the next. In some households, what happens? The language is lost, okay? In other households, the recipes are lost, okay? Uh, Sometimes what happens is just the fact that, that you move away. You see, I remember going out to Youngstown, Ohio, uh, and, 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 and because of the economy, many people were saying, you know, my, my, my family, we're a close-knit family, but people are being forced to take jobs, like a, a state away, okay? So that's a concern. August Wilson probably, I felt, for me, is, 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 is one of, and I used to say this when he was living, he was my favorite African-American writer. Uh, and, 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 I, and, I, I, and I put him above Toni Morrison in terms of importance. I said the reason why we probably would not rate him that high is because he's a playwright and many times we don't see his plays. And unless you're in a school situation, you're not reading a play, okay? But I'll tell you this August Wilson story, which is a classic. August Wilson was a good friend with my friend Charles Johnson. And these guys would, they, in fact he has a story called Nighthawks. They would get together every now and then and talk like all night long, you know, all night long. So what happened, you know, about art, culture, their families, they're having one of these long conversations at their, at their favorite restaurant, and then they look up and the restaurant's closing. So it's, you know, the waitress said, well, it's time to go. And they're in the middle of the conversation, we, 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 we can't be ready to go, we'll go home. So they say, okay, it's late, by one o'clock, where can we go? So they go across town, you know, where the neighborhood's open all night long. They go across town, as soon as they sit down, or everybody's in there. The coffee's weak and everything. And all of a sudden, he says, this black guy goes in, the tips in, goes in the back, gets into an argument with some guys in the back, then walks out, and then all hell breaks loose. And this is where Charles Johnson says, this is when he knew he was middle class, because he looked around and August Wilson was gone. <laughs> he, <laughs> he knew, he, August knew when to run. <laughs> you know? Charles was like, oh, what's going on here? <laughs> you know? you know, Charles said, it's going, right? So what happened? The police come, they arrest people, and what happened? You know, they got to go home. And, and what happened? Charles was saying, here, him and August had this wonderful evening, and that's all gone. 
right? So you get back in the car, he's driving August home, and August turns to Charles and says, yep. And people always ask me, how come black people don't come see my plays? I say they have enough drama in their own lives. <laughs> You know, and it's a, it's a big thing, you know, we say, well, you see, we, this is a typical day, how, do, how am I going to compete with this, you know? Yeah. But I say that, you know, I, I, I keep in my, in my office, um, I keep on, 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 on the desk a, a picture of August Wilson, Charles Johnson, and myself. They, uh, August and, and Charles came to a reading I gave at the Elliott Bay Bookstore in Seattle. Um, and, and it was one of the times where I really got to spend like a whole evening with him. Uh, the guy is just, just nonstop funny. If you go to see any August Wilson play. They're hilarious, you know? And, and what happens, the beauty, I think, of his plays, he just lets people talk, and then the story's woven together, you see? But, um, I mean, I, I, I just think he's, he's, a, he's a fantastic playwright. Uh, I think that he's changed uh, our, 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 our drama, like Eugene O'Neill. I mean, he's just, that, he's just that important, you know? And, and I think that uh, it would be good to see more communities putting on his full cycle of plays, okay? Not just Fences or the Piano Lesson, you know, but the full cycle, so you see the full range of his genius. Mm -hmm. I'm actually, it's going to be twofold. Okay. Um, in my opinion, but also just in my experience, poems need to be heard. Mm -hmm. um, there's cadence about them. Um, and so when you read them, they are alive and they're in their form. Mm -hmm. um, my second question is, is, is similar, and that is, I also feel like poem, poetry, is a lot like art, that you can't just walk by it, you have to spend some time, sure. and then you have to step back right. and let it kind of massage you. speak to right. you, massage you, right. and then you may need to revisit it a few times. Right. Um, and yet your, your poetry just now is so frenetic and so um, personal in voice, well, I think, yeah, I think I think it worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll answer this question this way. You know, one, I, I edit. Me and Jody Bowles, we edit Port Law Magazine, which is the all the. Thank you for your question. Okay, okay. Um, and go do well in that English class. <laughs> okay, take care. Um, <laughs> um, what happens at, at what Jody and I do at, at Port Law? Um, we read the, all the poems that we we wind up selecting. You know, uh, we, 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 we like the poem, we're reading it aloud. Um, sometime from reading it, we, we make the changes. It's, it's, it's extremely important. Um, so I say that's a, that's a practice that, that we do. Um, I also look at the, um, I look at Robert Pinsky, for example, who used to be poet laureate. Uh, Pinsky used to talk about how he got into poetry uh, in New Jersey, listening to the conductor mention the, the station, Hoboken. He's on Trenton, you know, that these names, the same way I was doing in terms of the thing about the Boston Red Sox, this sense of sound, you know, um, Bill Mambu Kett, you know, I just, I just love that, that, that sound. Uh, the Omar poems that I read was the real challenge that I had in terms of that I was reading them with a certain cadence. Uh, in fact, and in fact, if I show you some of the, the first Omar poems, um, the structure is, is, is all over the place, okay? And, 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 and I did that because I couldn't, structure the poem in such a way that I felt comfortable reading it and that the reader would, would, would pick it up. And so that was the thing where it took me finally, me looking at reading a lot of Billy Collins, you know, who was using tercets, but I was finally able to carve my poems, those Omar poems, into nice quatrains. So there's like four lines, four lines, to, 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 to enhance the, the, the reading of it. But it was this whole thing of sound and structure that I had to battle with it. Now your second part of your question is, is, is why poetry is so important. You know, it's, it's not like reading the newspapers and the headlines and, and, and it's like a carry out type thing. It, it forces you to work. Uh, many times what you find in, in a school situation is that people think that, you know, especially young kids, that the poetry is spinach. You know, <laughs> you don't like it, you know. Uh, but what happened, it, it forces you to, to work, okay. So when you look at somebody saying that poetry is difficult, well that's good, okay. Because if you read a poem and, and you come to a word that you don't understand, well then you've got to look it up. Okay, you have to work with the poem. And what happens? The poems that I read, for example, about my mother, takes on a completely different meaning now that my mother's gone. Okay, now what happened? I could read this poem, maybe be a change in your family, and you come back to that poem. Okay, I like to think that you know, when I'm teaching poetry, uh, especially to young people, I, I say that every poem has a, has a window. 
you know, you know that, that you can sort of crawl in and, and walk around in. And, and, and so what happens, you never know whether that's the first line, the middle of the poem, but there has to be something that you connect to that pulls you in, okay? But the key thing with poetry is that you have to come back to it and read it again and again, okay? And you read it in such a way where, where you almost taste the, the, the words, okay? And this is why you can look at the whole thing in terms of how you read. Um, the use of white space is very important. These pauses, it's, it's this silence, the space where you get your breath, and then you proceed to the next, the next, the next thing. And keep in mind, like these stanzas are little rooms, right? We're in a little room right now, right? We're, we're, in, a, we're, we're in the opening stanza, okay? So did we move yet? No, we're still here, right? <laughs> okay, and now we get up, we go to the next stanza. You see, that's how we have to read. You see, and, 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 and what it is, it requires patience. And this is why this genre is so important for now. Because everybody's clicking and doing this and doing that and, you know, and, and multitasking and stuff like that. The poem, I found like Thich Nhat Hanh now, <laughs> mindfulness, yes. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, but, but what happens is that in a good way, that's what poetry can do. And, and this is why, along with all the other food groups, you know, a little poetry, you know, right? A little poetry is good. Okay? So that's important. Mm -hmm. uh, last November, while you were scheduled to appear on mm -hmm. uh, I secured the, the fifth inning and read it, and if I get the analogy correct, I'm in the sixth inning. Wow. <laughs> and as I read the book, I'm saying, gosh, Ethelbert is writing the same things that I feel. So prior to you coming this time, I secured the uh, Fathering Words, mm -hmm. and as I was reading the book, I could understand why I related so well to what you wrote here is because you and I grew up the same way. Mm -hmm. I mean, your relationship with your father was the same as mine. Mm -hmm. And it just, um, it was very touching. And it, it, it helped me to better understand how I related so yeah. well to this. And, your list of things that you I can't do, right. cannot do, right. you would be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk, right? <laughs> you, do you know how to drive? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, well, you've got one up on me. <laughs> um, your dad worked for the Postal Service, and I assume that he was a, a mail clerk? No, he worked in, in he didn't deliver the mail door to door, but he worked in, in, in the post office facility sorting the mail. Okay, mail, uh, yeah, right. That, okay, well, right. I'm, I'm a retired mail clerk. Okay. So, we really there with that, right? Well, yeah. And, but I would like to say that, please, everybody, get this book and read it. But read fathering words huh. first. You know, I'm glad you said that because you're one of the few people who I have another friend of mine uh, who, this year, and he knew me for a long time. He he, he read them he read them together, you know, and 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 um, that was the thing where where I didn't realize what I was doing. My my statement I say now because I'm teaching a lot of memoir classes is that in fathering words, what I was doing was sort of mapping my life. You know, I came from here to here. Uh, but with fathering, uh, with, with the fifth inning, what I was doing was mining my life, okay? Digging deeper, okay? And if you look at the Chilean, we're talking about the Chilean miners that were trapped like a year ago. If you look at the mining the mine, like for memories, mining the mine, look, think about it. And if you look at it in terms of mind, many times what happened? Minds, things are trapped in minds. So you have your memories, you see? There's secrets. Say that you don't want to bring light that's down in there, um, they're trapped. Uh, these are your memory. Also look in terms of what happens is that the mind is also rich with resources and minerals. So there's, there's things in there that you really don't want to lose. Okay, uh, keep in mind that uh, if you want to get them out, you sometimes have to collaborate with people. You know, if somebody helped you to get them out. And then what are you talking about? You're talking about bringing things to light. Okay, bringing things to light. And so what happens with the fifth inning, you know, uh, I dedicated it to my wife because I was, you know, was dealing with the whole thing in terms of relationships and things of that sort and, and trying to be very honest with it. Uh, and then what I, what I wound up doing um, is the book sort of mirrors baseball, where it's one game that begins and ends at home. So when you think about that, so, so what happened at the end of fifth, you see me, my wife is coming to get me, to pick me up from VCCA, so I had to bring it all the way back, back home um, in, in terms of that. But, you know, I share the book with like middle school kids. They prefer Father and Word because they felt that uh, the fifth inning was a little dark. But then for um, people now, and, and this is where books sometimes, you don't write 
knowing how much, to, well, sometimes you're not aware of how various social movements, conditions affect your writing and, and the backdrop. So now you look at how many people across the country have been laid off. People thought they were going to have a pension. They get in the, the, that fifth inning. And what happened? Somebody's coming in and said, give me the ball. Pat you on your butt. You know, maybe pat, not pat you on your butt, say so you just got an hour to get off the plant, you know. But what, no butt patting, you know what I'm saying? But what happened is that this is a thing where you look up. I think a lot of people begin to realize, well, I was all set, okay. Then what are we doing? Other, other thing to look at. Just look at your friends. Well, look, let me show you this. How many of you right now in this room know someone that has breast cancer? Look at it, you see? This is what we're talking about, okay. And somebody, you look at somebody who's sailing along, and then all of a sudden there's a lump, or there's this or that. And, and, and that's, that's unbelievable, okay? That, that's the type of place that we live in. And so all of a sudden now, you have a lot of people who are dealing with being in the fifth inning. You see? They want to know whether they, you know, they, they can last another inning. You see? And you don't know. See, that's why in, 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 in the poem that's in there, you go through the first part of the batting order, you know, you know you get, yeah, now the hitters have adjusted. See? And so now you've got to deal with it again. And what happens? Here are friends of yours that might commit suicide, get killed in car accidents, and all this. You're going to feel your mentality. You see? And, and, and I can say this. Look at this. About eight people in here will probably be a hostage at some time in their life. You think that's strange? A hostage. Okay? Now I use myself as an example. AWP conference. I'm flying out to Colorado. I'm not bothering anybody. I got some books to read. <laughs> and then what happened? Somebody decides, joking and whatnot, and we look out. Here's fighter jets. You know, we're in the back. And all of a sudden, it's a, hot, it's a situation where we think somebody wants to blow up the plane. And, and, and you know things are serious when, when you land and the plane keeps taxiing for like a good hour, you know, <laughs> <laughs> away from the trip. You know, we'll be on the ground a long time. <laughs> you know, and, and then you know, but during the plane's taxiing, where airline steward says, we don't want anyone to use your cell phones. Then she comes back and says, if you use your cell phone, I'm going to take it away. <laughs> Whoa, right? And then what happened? You're sitting in the back of the plane, and then you look up, and then all of a sudden, you see somebody being let off with, ha with handcuffs, and here comes the FBI, right? Then it becomes really unreal. Since we're in the back, we don't listen to the airline student, we're looking at our text phone. And all of a sudden, what do we discover? We're the news. We are the plane. Oh, wow. And, and then it gets real. And then the guy who's head of the FBI who comes on the plane, he looks a little like Bruce Willis. So now I'm not believing this at all. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, but that's just me. See, all yesterday, I called my wife to check on her. I'm here in Victoria, right? Everything what could go wrong. And she said, oh, yes, somebody was a bomb scare, and, and I couldn't get to the car. The car was, <laughs> that's the, eight people in this room, okay? Now, somebody, who wants the movie contract? Okay, eight, about eight, somebody in here is going to be hostage. That's just the odds. You could be, you know, look at it. In D.C., this happened to my wife. What are the odds? Two pay periods in a row, two pay periods in a row, going to the bank to cash your check and the bank's being held up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would change bank with, with, with fees included. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, we, we, we're dealing with this pay type. The five. Pay, pay the five percent. <laughs> we're dealing with these types. You, you see the numbers for, for breast cancer? If I went down the series of other things, th this is what they need to teach you in these classes. This is what you're up against. How many of you will not find jobs in your field? You see? This, this is what we're talking about. So you'll be reading poetry. <laughs> support, right? You know what I'm talking about. But these are the things that you do. Any other questions you have? I'll take one more question. Yeah, one more question. Oh. You, you were the question. Yeah. I am the question. Hey, I, I do have a question. Okay. Um, he says now. Talk, talk about um, taking on uh, Oh. And the long history of that journal, I don't know that the audience would necessarily know about this journal, yeah. but, you know, the, the sense of responsibility. I tell you, yeah, right, sense of responsibility. How you handle it. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 was, it was a trick. Uh, what happened is I had a Port Law with, with my friend Jody Bowles, uh, Port Law Magazine, L-R-E, Port Law. Uh, Port Law was founded in 1889. It's the oldest ongoing poetry magazine. 
Um, and right now we're housed out of the Writers Center. I did not know how much responsibility this was until you know maybe the second, third month. Uh, I thought you just added a few pack packets to come in, that's it. Packets are coming in as I stand here. It's just X number of packets keep coming in. Um, they're packed and sent to me from the Writers Center in about maybe 20 writers at a time. Okay, out of that 20, I might find maybe one poem. Okay, that's what we're talking about. Uh, I've learned a lot about what's happening in our country because what happens, the poetry reflects. You know, I mean, I can go down the illnesses. Okay, you see a growing older America. You're beginning to see now people writing who don't have work. You know, you're, you're, seeing, you're seeing these types of poems. Uh, what I've done and with Jody, I, I think I've changed the magazine. Um, Port Ma Port magazine was a magazine I, I never picked up. I hated the cover. You know, it was always like somebody's girlfriend's artwork was on the cover. I hated it. <laughs> you know, I'm saying I hated it. So, and, you know, I, I, so what, that, when, I, when I came in, the first thing I changed was the cover. Okay? And then my wife, my wife changed the, last, the issue before last. Well, this, is how, this, this was that show. My, Jody and I have our meetings at my house. Okay? So all the packages, this happens over maybe every month and a half, we have our meeting. And as I said, we're reading all the poems that are going to be selected. My wife goes by. This is how my wife does. She said, well, you're going to put some black people on the cover. <laughs> 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 she goes upstairs. She, and, and you know what? I didn't even, I didn't, you know, there had never been any black people on the cover of Port Law Magazine. You know, and so what happened? We found this nice picture out of, you know, the 50s with dealing with desegregation. But, you know, she, she said something that nobody would ever say. But what we tried to do is, is the covers are key. Like, for example, right now there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tornado on the cover of the latest issue. We deal with issues of environment. Uh, we deal with issues in terms of what's happened politically. So we set up. Then what we do, every poem follows the, the next. See, I always felt that what happened, people don't read poetry magazines or even poetry books from the first page and go like that. They just jump in. Okay? If you are publishing a magazine, the first thing you do is look for your poem. Look for your poem, see any spelling, look for your bio note, and then you're happy. Okay? So what <laughs> happened, <laughs> that's how people read. What I try to do is, is, is make sure every poem follows the next. Okay. Now this might be why we might select a poem, because we already have a poem that we think this is going to complement that poem. But it takes out the laying out. We just returned back to publishing translations. We had gotten away from that because we weren't receiving that many. But now we're open to translation, which I think ca also captures a change in America. Uh, and we're talking about you know a lot of different languages, not just Spanish and, and, and French, uh, with other languages in which people are writing. And so we, we're happy to be open to that. We're doing more reviews. Of poetry, you know. So if you're writing, think about writing reviews. You know, think about. It. We only come out twice a year, so you know, there's not that much we can offer. But at the same time, we've we've done some unique things. We have a section called Poets Introducing Poets, and you and what I try to do with that is get our contributing editors to really do something. I suppose just have their name on the masthead. <laughs> you know, you know, like, oh yes, you know, you know, <laughs> Shakespeare's here. Are <laughs> you know, Shakespeare do some work? What happened <laughs> is is that um, we 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 do that, and and what happened. It means that the magazine is not just going to be Jody and my, uh, on, our, on our taste. It means what we try to do is find a contributing editor whose work is completely different from ours. Okay? Uh, when I was selecting the contributing editors, I wanted to make sure that they were from all parts of the country. Okay? One of the things from being a literary activist and, and, and being on a lot of panels for a lot of the major foundations and also meeting for the NEA fellowships, I realized that you have this regional bias. Okay? If, for example, you go back to the last election, we just discovered, oh, Hawaii and Alaska is part of the United States. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> you know? um, so what happens, it's the same thing with poetry. You know, that if you look up, sometimes we're not reading poetry from, like, say, the, the, the West or the Midwest. Okay? Everything like from the New Yorker, edited by Paul Muldoon. You know, that's another issue. Um, but what happens is that this is what we try to struggle with and try to change at Poet Law Magazine. And we go back. I mean, we're a magazine which Walt Whitman advertised in. So right there we feel that there's something that we should be upholding. <laughs> I mean, what was, I mean, Bill Clinton was giving Monica Lewinsky a copy of Leaves of Grass uh, in there. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> Thank you. That's all for today. <laughs> That's all for today. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, there are books for sale. Thank you all for coming. And our next speaker is December 1st. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bill. Monica Lewinsky. Look at you.